and I am an addictions physician working out of Toronto, Canada. And today I'm going to talk about my favorite subject, which is food addiction. This is the lecture that's the full lecture on food addiction. And in the background there, you can see I have a lot of resources. You'll get this lecture. I have the Facebook group, I have Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life, which is free. I have my book called Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction. I am co-host of a podcast called Food Junkies, which is basically a jump off from the book and the YouTube channel, which you are now watching. And thank you for doing so. So this class, I'm going to talk about, first of all, the processed food industry, because all of it starts from there. Then I'm going to introduce the, the two drives to overeat, the hormonal model of overeating and the neurochemical model of overeating. And food addiction taps into both of those. Then I'm going to talk about how these natural drives to eat can be hijacked by processed foods so that we then end up having a condition that looks an awful lot like food addiction. You can go from just eating addictively and morph into this condition that we call food addiction and that that condition actually has various stages attached to it and depending on what stage you're attached to that will indicate what treatment is best for you. Underlying the whole conversation I'm going to be talking about how food, specifically sugar, specifically processed foods, acts like a drug on the brain and so you won't get very far if you're struggling with overeating if you don't address the addiction dynamic. Now you may not be a food addict but you are suffering an addiction dynamic if you're eating processed foods because that's their job is to introduce that dynamic into regular eating. Finally, I want to give a message of hope because once you acknowledge that there is an addiction dynamic and address that and treat that, you will then be free on the other side. Love the food that you're eating and be free of the obsessive thoughts to eat more of it. If you have an issue with weight, you'll get to that normal weight that your body is destined to be, and you will maintain it and keep it off. It worked well to be a food addict and work in the food industry because part of my job was recipe development, testing things, tasting things. You know, nobody would bat an eye because no one blinked an eye if I gained 50 pounds in a year at the bakery where I worked because it just sort of stood to reason. Part of my job is to eat this food and perfect it, right? So, um, but you know, the, the other side of the coin to that was eventually the entire scope of my life was reduced to nothing but food and work. And I, you know, my work gave me a lot of gifts, but it also worked against me because it kind of kept me tied into both sort of addictions, right? I, I literally could not connect to joy. I just couldn't, not even from food. You know, I used to be able to eat food and, and feel the passion of it and just love everything about it, the taste, the effect on my brain, the sensations, the textures, everything about it, it got me high. And eventually I that didn't happen anymore. And, um, you know, I remember one night sitting in the parking lot at work crying, in the dark at 11 o'clock at night, because I just didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know where to turn. Nothing made sense. Um, I was really deep in isolation at that point. It was work and nothing else. Um, I had more or less cut my family off. And again, nothing made sense. I was lonely, but I wanted to be alone all the time. So, um, and one other thing I remember very clearly, I could not look myself in the eye in the mirror. I just, I couldn't find a single thing about myself that I loved, liked, respected. So, you know, all this that I had built up around my success, my job, my food, my ability to create food for others, none of that was working for me anymore. It wasn't even there anymore. At night, I think I'd been at work since probably six in the morning and I was driving home and, um, 
had the radio on on that station, which I never would. And I hear this, you know, preamble coming up that there's going to be this interview playing about this doctor who who treats food addiction. And I'm like enraged. I'm thinking, what kind of doctor <laughs> advocates for the idea of food addiction? You know, we should all be responsible for our choices, et cetera, et cetera. And in the, I was ready to call in. I didn't even realize it was a recorded interview. I'm thinking I'm going to call in and I'm going to tear a strip off this doctor, right? <laughs> and you started to speak and you started to explain it. And in under one minute, hmm. I had to pull off to the side of the road. I was crying my eyes out because that was the moment that my, my life literally made sense in that moment. I finally understood what I had been struggling with, what this pain was, what this obsession was, that was the moment, just like a light bulb, it all made sense. And, um, and I also heard in that interview that there's a possible solution, if I'm willing to look at the addiction treatment model for, for my eating problem, right. And um, that was the moment of hope for me. I mean, I had absolutely no faith whatsoever. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know how it could be possible. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just knew this is, this sounds like the only thing I haven't tried. And it sounds like it's worked for other people. And when I failure, this is a real thing. This is a disease. And it's also not a magic wand to be in treatment. If you're willing to do, take the actions that are told to you, you know, um, simple things, meditating, committing food, things that seem small, but at the end of the day, they add up to like today, I've got over three and a half years of, of recovery. So let's get started. No talk is worth its salt unless it addresses the processed food uh, environment that we live in. And it's so important that in fact, in the world of food addiction, people are quarreling all the time. Should we call it sugar addiction? Should we call it processed food addiction? Should we call it just food addiction? Should we call it eating addiction? What should we call this thing that drives a lot of us to overeat? Because processed food is the fundamental player in this. I mean, processed food is essentially not food. It's a food product designed by food engineers who are paid a lot of money to make foods highly addictive. That's their job. And if you're eating processed food, you're subject to that. Processed food is not food, it is a food product. And that's super important to recognize because when I say quit sugar or quit flour or quit these things, I'm not talking about quitting real food like fruits and vegetables. I'm actually saying from the get-go, the best thing to do if you don't want to listen to any more of this talk or read any more books, just quit processed food and you'll probably do quite well for yourself. I'm coming from the background as an addiction doctor, so I'm very interested in the addictive component of food. There has been a fair amount of talk about the toxicity of sugar and where we're seeing that a lot is in the rates of obesity and metabolic syndrome. And here's just an example, just to see, you can see what we're talking about with a rise. So if we look behind me at the graph behind me here, I'm going to get out of the way. Um, you see that in 1700s, there was a fairly low amount of sugar consumption and that that graph just gets higher and higher and higher. And you can see that it's trajectory upwards um, as of the 1900s and especially there I am still in the way um, passed into two, the year 2000 and up. It's just like from between 1970, 1980, all the way up, it's been almost <laughs> upwards. Another graph with the citations, by the way, attached that shows it even more clearly. That light line above is sugar consumption and the dark blue bands are all rates of diabetes increasing, 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 almost in parallel with a sugar consumption. It's very hard to say that sugar has no role in the rate of the increase of diabetes. Just one more graph just to add more fuel to the fire. The red line is sugar consumption. You can see the line going up. This is from 1960s all the way into to 2010. You can see that the line is going up and up and up. And then the yellow line, we can see the rate of obesity increasing, increasing, increasing. It doesn't show proof, but when you have so many correlations in various indices, this is a different 
set of data, then another set of data, and another set of data, it's very hard not to at least be highly suspicious that there's a connection. Most of the awareness of this has probably started since the 1950s, because when did the processed food industry really get its teeth into our way of eating? It's probably after the war, the, the Second World War. Although there was ice cream and pop, like Coca-Cola and, and processed foods before that, it really made a dent in our system uh, post-1950s. So even from the get-go, people were already talking about, hey, there's something with this phenomena of processed food and the high sugar content of processed food that people were talking about early days. One book in, the, in 1957 called Pure, White and Deadly by John Yudkin, unfortunately, it got ignored. It got lost in the whole low-fat movement. I think it was 1961, Overeaters Anonymous came up. So we had AA since 1935. Somebody realized already by the 60s, hey, people are eating foods the way that other people are drinking. And so Overeaters Anonymous mimicking AA or Alcoholics Anonymous came on the scene as early as that. People were already talking about how people were eating too much or eating erratically. And then in the 1970s, 80s, the eating disorder movement came on the scene. These were the psychologists who recognized, yes, people are eating inappropriately. Mm -hmm. They weren't really connecting the dots that it had to do with processed food. Food, it was about how people were using food as comfort or to psychologically heal themselves from previous trauma or from stress of the day, uh, and that some people relied on food more than other things. And the eating disorder model dominated the scene for the longest time until really the 2000s. Then by around the 2000s, we had people starting to discover, you've all heard the famous um, rat studies, rats that choose sugar, sweetener over cocaine. Those kinds of studies started to show up in the 2000s. They're very academic, research oriented, you know, using rats, not people, but the idea came up on the scene. Yeah, there's actually research that's confirming what we intuitively believe, which is that this is addictive. But nobody was actually in the professional world talking about it. And it took people like Dr. Robert Lustig and his wonderful video called Sugar, the Bigger the Truth. He really introduced a lot of people to this concept that there is actually some science in the clinical manifestation of, of uh, sugar addiction and the toxicity of sugar. It still didn't get raised into what we call common standard of practice, but people were talking about it more and more often. And that's kind of where we are now. We're now at a stage where we're saying, clinically, there's obviously something, but it's not being acknowledged in the DSM-5 or in the um, ICD. And a lot of us in the field right now are trying to push for that acknowledgement because once we get that acknowledgement, then we'll get funding, proper medications, for the condition and we'll just get treatment in general, treatment centers or outpatient programs. If we're in a really uh, exciting phase of food addiction, but we're not quite recognized, we, we haven't quite hit the tipping point yet. And so I'm really hoping that those of you who are watching this feel inspired to join us in this revolution. It's basically the food revolution against the processed food industry. If you're interested in this subject and you want to know more, I mentioned my book, Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction. So that's a primer. It's a very easy book to read and it will introduce you to a lot of the concepts that I'm talking about today in, in this uh, lecture. Another book that's really useful if you're wanting something that's more clinical, more research based, you want to actually have the citations and the references to prove what you're talking about. I would highly recommend that you get this book called Process Food Addiction by Joan Ifland et al. A newer book that's come out also very research focused and clinical focused. I think both of those books are books that you need to have on your bookshelf, especially if you're a clinician or a researcher or a PhD student or somebody interested in food addiction. These are books that you want to get. So I'm so blown away by this article. It's such a good article by Dr. David Wiss called Sugar Addiction from Evolution to Revolution. If you just want to get the whole history of food addiction, the academic history, as well as the clinical history in one article, this is the article to get. The books are good because they're good references if you want to dig into a topic, but this gives you a nice overview of the clinical and research world. I believe I was born addicted to sugar because from the time I can remember myself and even before that, there was no amount of sugar in the world that could satisfy me. Anytime I had any form of candies or sweets or junk food, 
I had to finish whatever was in front of me. I always wanted more. My brother and sister, my older brother and sister say they never wanted to hold my hand when I was little because they were always sticky. They called them Sippy's jam hands. Like, so obviously I was like really in the sugar from, I had this fatal attraction to sugar from before I can even remember myself. And, but really, I think that my, it, it really took off as an addiction once I got married and I had children, small children, um, and they say that, you know, that addiction is something that that left unchecked will go and develop more. And that's exactly what happened. If it was something that I used to like sweets or ate a little too much, but I was never a fat kid or anything like that, um, then it came to a point where I was binging once in a while and then it was more than once in a while. And at the height, you know, at the height of my addiction, I was, it was like, I was never hungry. I was never full. I just felt like I have to eat something and I could eat copious amounts of food and binging. And it was just, and here's the thing, I'm a nurse, right? <laughs> and I really like them. I was successful in just about every area of my life, except being able to lose weight and control my eating. That was on a person, I had two aha moments, right? On the personal level, the aha moment was when I, um, I was working with a doctor in a clinic, in one of the, in a clinic, and she, um, she's still a dear friend of mine. She's a very funny lady. I really liked her because she was very funny and I liked her even more because she was fatter than me. And, uh, and, but she told me that as fat as she was, she had lost 20 kilos by think by treating her, her eating as a, as an addiction. And that was like somebody lit a light bulb in my head. It was like, wow, that's me. Like I, I'm, I'm a junk food junkie. Yes. It's an addiction. And through the 12 step program, I recovered. And that was 24 years ago. I think it's closing on 25 soon. Um, it's been a rocky road. It hasn't been smooth sailing the whole time, but I can say that for those 25 years, the huge, you know, huge majority of those days have been free from the obsession of I want to introduce to you the body mass index. It's not a great measure, but it's the one that we use in science, in research, in clinical work. We need to use it because everybody else is using it, even though everybody knows it's not that great. It's a measure of weight over height squared. It's a ratio. You can find it easily on the internet. Type in your height and your weight and you'll find out what you are. And the goal is to be between 20 and 25. If you're under 20, then you're considered underweight and anything over 25 is considered obese. So you could be from 30 to 35, that's mildly obese, then severely obese, then morbidly obese, and then super obese. These measures are important mainly for the determination of if a person qualifies for treatment, whether it be bariatric surgery, whether it be medication. So we need to have that scale. It's obvious that it's not very good because really take into account gender differences to measure where that weight is coming from. Is it coming from muscle, fat tissue, adipose tissue? And then if it is coming from fat, is it coming from the good fat or the bad fat? We don't throw it out because it's been a very useful measure to predict particular illnesses. Have a look at this chart. This tells you based on body mass index, what the likelihood is that you will get these medical complications of obesity based on a body mass index. So if your body mass index is in the morbidly obese range, or even just the obese range, you run the risk of having pulmonary disease, fatty liver disease, gallbladder disease, gynecological abnormalities, osteoarthritis, stroke, metabolic syndrome, which includes diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, and various other conditions, even the possibility of getting cancer or Alzheimer's. Based on the recognition that weight can lead to a lot of these conditions, thanks to the body mass index indications, we have had a new medical discipline emerge, which is bariatric medicine. And bariatric medicine comes from bariatric surgeons who were the people who dealt with surgeries, the various types of surgery, there are four different types of bariatric surgery, to clinicians who were working in the, in the bariatric world but didn't want to do surgery, they wanted to use medications instead. This is a new field that's come out in the last 15 years 
as obesity has become more and more prevalent in society and all the conditions associated with becoming more and more prevalent require doctors to deal with these specific conditions. Interestingly enough, in the early days of bariatric medicine and bariatric surgery, the recommendation was always lose weight and then these conditions won't happen. And you know, what happened when a doctor would tell a patient to lose weight, the person would lose the weight, but then within three months, four months, maybe a half a year, maybe a year, they would come back having gained the weight and act, in fact, having gained even more weight. They would feel so shamed, so embarrassed that they might be lost to treatment. They just won't come back because they're so embarrassed. And this whole concept now of fat stigma has evolved to kind of recognize that this isn't helping people for us to tell people to lose weight. And so that that push to lose weight kind of through diet anyway, has really been pushed to the wayside. In fact, because medications were so not useful, it generally, it was encouraged not to make that a major focus of clinical awareness. It was mainly let's treat the conditions that extra weight has brought with it. And it isn't until the new medications that have just come out, the GLP-1s, that now where people are again very encouraged, oh, people actually can lose weight, that that concept of weight loss has come back up on the, on the list of concern. But bariatric medicine has until recently been mainly let's just deal with the conditions and really hope the person doesn't gain more weight recognizing that obesity is a chronic and progressive condition. And these clinicians have used mainly the endocrine model, the hormonal model. They mainly understood obesity in the context of what are the hormones that are causing a disarray, not really recognizing the connection with the processed food industry. Unfortunately, not even today that that's really a case, but definitely looking at the hormonal model. And these are categories that were conceptualized by Phil Riddell. He said, you know what? It's useful to see it as three different categories. There's normal eaters that are overeating. There are people who have the psychological disturbance of eating disorders and there are food addicts. As I said, you can be all three of those. And I'm gonna talk about each of these categories. I'll focus on normal eaters, the endocrine model or the hormonal model of overeating. And I'm gonna make a nod to the eating disorders. And then of course, I'm gonna talk about food addiction because that's the subject that is often neglected in the larger clinical world, but I think is actually the key dynamic because we're living in a processed food world. If we don't acknowledge the power of this engineering of food to our mind, we're going to miss a huge piece. So let me start by talking about normal overeaters. People who are normal, they don't have any disease, but they're overeating. Something is creating this drive to overeat. And I'm going to call that the endocrine or hormonal model. Let me start with that. Now, this hormonal model is premised on the concept of I just have to exercise more and eat less. It's that calories in, calories out model. And a lot of us now recognize that obesity and weight is a lot more than just eating less, exercising more. It's also very much dependent on what you're eating, but the general medical response has still been within this, what I think is a fairly archaic model of the eat less, exercise more model. When we talk about the hormonal model, we're talking about basically three key hormones. There are more hormones for sure, but today I'm gonna to talk about ghrelin, insulin, and leptin. That's the top box. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone that drives a normal person to eat. They're hungry. It's released from the stomach when a person is starting to get hungry. It's that feeling when you're a little bit hungry and you start to think about, it's like a little bell ringing saying, hey, it's time to eat. It's not overwhelming you, but it's there reminding you. So if you had breakfast at eight o'clock by 1030, the stomach is emptying and ghrelin is increasing. And this hormone, ghrelin, works in combination with leptin. Leptin is the satiety hormone. That's the hormone that kicks in when your stomach is filling. It takes about 20 minutes if you're eating, not gulping food down like you can with processed food, but if you're actually chewing your vegetables and you're having a conversation, you're not wolfing it down. It takes about 20 minutes for leptin to recognize the stomach is filling, a hormone is released. You're aware, hey, I'm getting full. Leptin and ghrelin work really well together. Ghrelin is up when you're hungry, and then as you're filling up, it's going down, and the leptin is starting to go up, and it's telling you, hey, you're full after 20 minutes. These two work really well together, and if we could just stay with that, we would be fine. This is not disordered eating, this is normal eating. I love this scale because it really describes well the difference between disordered eating and normal eating. 
gray linen lepta would fit between the four and seven. So this is a scale that goes from one being extremely hungry, that's over here, I am so hungry that I'll eat anything in sight, to I'm so full, I just can't imagine fitting in anything else. We don't want to be so hungry that we'll eat anything and we don't want to be so full that we're uncomfortable. We want to be, be between the four and seven. Graylin and leptin will give us that. That is a food plan that consists of real food. You can be a vegetarian and just eat vegetables or you can be keto, or you're only eating meats and fats. It doesn't matter. The four and seven is perfect. What happens when you're in the extremely hungry, I'm eating so much that I'll eat anything. I'll eat to the point where I'm stuffed full. That's another chemical that is insulin. Insulin is not supposed to be a hunger hormone. It's actually a satiety hormone. When insulin is working properly, the sugars are being managed, you're not hungry, it's all good. But what happens when you eat to the point of starvation, when you eat because you're so hungry that you'll eat anything, chances are you're what we would be calling hypoglycemic. Your sugar is low. The insulin is too high. This is not a normal insulin anymore. It's working overtime. It's doing too much. Because what is the job of insulin? Clear sugar from the blood. It regulates sugar. It's actually what we call a order molecule. It actually takes sugar into the cell because why? The cells require glucose. I want to take a second here to explain this. Our brains require glucose. That is our fuel for the brain. And we need the fuel for the brain in the same way as we need oxygen for the brain. If I don't have oxygen within three to four minutes, my brain will start to die and I'll have brain damage. Similarly, if I don't get glucose, if I don't get the fuel that I need, I will, first of all, become highly agitated. My body, my brain is recognizing Vera is not getting fuel. She can't be focusing on anything else but getting more fuel. So there's hunger, 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 and intensity and what we call hangry, that kind of behavior. Behavior. If you're still not getting food, eventually what will happen is that you could fall into a coma and die. Now, we see that happening with a diabetic. Insulin is a key player to getting that glucose into the brain cells and to the body cells. It's crucial. Now, for those of you who are thinking, what is all this about carbohydrates and proteins and fats? There are basically three macronutrients. There are carbohydrates, which are all the fruits and vegetables and cereals and breads and sugar and all that stuff. And a lot of the processed food industry is focused there. There's proteins, which is dairy, meat, cheese, and then there's fats. And that would be fats like anything from the fat of, of your steak and chicken skin, oil, butter, lard. In that carbohydrates are either complex or very refined. We often call this the glycemic index. Here are a bunch of glucose molecules, glucose linked together, which then become a starch molecule. And the more links that you have, more the more clumps of glucose that you have, the more complex that carbohydrate, it, then it's called a carbohydrate. If it's just one thing, it's called glucose, but if it's multiple glucoses added together, it becomes a carbohydrate. It's the bigger the clump is, the more complex the carbohydrate is. And the fewer the clumps are, whether just one or two or three, the more simple or refined the carbohydrate is. On the glycemic index, which is essentially how quickly any carbohydrate breaks down into sugar over the course of two hours, we have a, a continuum from uh, zero to 100. And if it's sugar, 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 only glucose, which is basically sugar is glucose and fructose, the glucose going to the brain and the body, the fructose going to the liver, if it's only glucose, that's 100. That's, and, and my brain needs that. My brain needs fuel. It needs glucose as much as it needs oxygen. I can die with a lack of both of those. It needs glucose. So any carbohydrate that I eat will eventually, whether it's a clump or a single, will go to the brain to give me the fuel that I need and to my muscles and the rest of my body. How quickly it breaks down is that glycemic index. Glycemic index is essentially a, a line where uh, somebody has said, you know, when it's 50 and under is very complex and takes a long time to break into sugar. And the body is built for that long, steady trickle of glucose to the brain. When I eat at eight o'clock in the morning, I don't want all my fuel all at once. I want to carry it over for the next three or four hours until my lunch or my dinner. So I need something that will take a long time to break down. And it's been designated that 50 and under is good. Broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, all of the vegetables. Anything over 50 is sugar, obviously, because sugar is 100. Bread, which is like 80, 85. 
popcorn, which is like 70. These are all refined, simple sugars. They'll break down into sugar very quickly before the two hour mark. And so you'll be hungry within two hours because we want to eat a meal so that it actually takes a good three or four hours before we're hungry. Again, if you're eating highly complex foods like fruits and vegetables, that's fine, it'll take that long. But if you're eating a lot of pasta and cereal and bread and things that on the glycemic index are very close to sugar, you're gonna be hungry within an hour. That's why you get hungry after a pancake breakfast with a lot of maple syrup or cereal with a lot of sugar on top of it, quickly getting all the energy that should have lasted for three to four hours all at once. That's why you're full of energy, bursting with energy at first, and then you poop out after uh, an hour and a half or two. That's the glycemic index. Just to recap, I've explained the glycemic index, complex carbohydrates all the way to simple carbohydrates and how quickly they break down into the fuel that my brain needs. Now, where does insulin play into this? Well, insulin has to mop up all this sugar that you have just had an infusion of if you're eating processed foods, which are almost always within that realm of 50 to 100. They have basically done the processing, the cleaving of each of those carbohydrates into simple sugars for you so that you get it all at once. The pancreas, which makes insulin, has to create bursts of insulin to handle those bursts of sugar. And so now in an hour and a half, you're, there's no more fuel and now you're hungry but you're not hungry at a four you're hungry at a one so if you look at this schedule you're over here at the uh extremely hungry range this is thanks to insulin the fuel is down and that means that you are at risk to die the brain doesn't know what's going to happen it just recognizes no there's no more fuel and it's going to take a few days before you get into that fat adaption mode if there's literally no more glucose that you can have, if there's literally no more carbohydrates that you can eat. You're into that extreme hungry mode because there's no more fuel, which will then impel you to eat more than the seven, which is just full, all the way over to the sick. I'm so full that I'm sick because you're trying to compensate when the stress response is kicked in. And so you're going to eat, 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 eat to ensure that there's enough fuel and you get super sick. Now, this is a biological hormonal response to eating too many refined carbohydrates. In other words, processed food. This doesn't mean that you're a food addict. It's a natural response to this abnormal environment. You are constantly in a day which can happen like this can happen in a cycle of an hour and a half. You eat a lot of refined carbohydrates, the insulin pumps up, it empties out the glucose in your system. Now you're super hungry and you're going to the food cupboard not to eat an apple or a Brussels sprout because your fuel is down. You don't have two or three hours to break it down. You want to eat something that will give you fuel right away, which is of course, more processed food so you're going to eat way too much get super sick back over to here there's another burst of insulin and then you're going to be up and down constantly up and down the sugar spike that goes up and then you have the crash that goes down now you're going to eat as if you're um, experiencing extreme hunger this is uh, the cycle that happens and this looks like food addiction this is when a person is saying i'm eating and i can't help it because if i don't eat all i can think about is food because of course the brain is going, hey, there's no fuel. Like, it's not gonna let you not think about food. This is just the work of insulin. Insulin is a hunger hormone when we think about it in the context of hypoglycemia, which means low sugar. Now, one of the things that does happen, the body does have a backup system. If you're in a circumstance where there are no uh, ways to get glucose, because where do we get glucose? We get glucose through gar carbohydrates. Typically in hunting gathering times, we would get our glucose through carbohydrates like the fruits that are growing from trees or the stuff that you could pull off from the ground. These kinds of carbohydrates would be in abundance in the summertime. And then the rest of the time you would rely on hunting and gathering the hunting. So you would be hunting your deer or your fish, whatever is in nature that was available to eat. And you would gather nuts and berries. We have a backup system where our brain absolutely needs glucose. This is, it's the preference. But if there is no glucose on board because you're not, you don't have the carbohydrates available because where you live or it's the weather, then we have another backup system, which we call the ketone system. And that's where we get our energy through fats and proteins. It will always go for the carbohydrates if they're on board first. But if they're not on board, I will then turn to fats and proteins for my energy. There, I don't get glucose. I get something called ketones. Ketones 
come from the food that I'm eating, if it's if it's uh, proteins and fats like the meats and cheeses that I'm eating. And if I'm not eating anything because I'm starving, I'll use my own fats, my own muscle, and then eventually uh, eat up vital organs and die of starvation. This is the premise of the ketone diet. It's saying carbohydrates, especially in today's world where it's so hard to get good, healthy carbohydrates, let's just bypass that system and use the ketone system because that's just as efficient as carbohydrates. In fact, some people would argue it's even more efficient. It's certainly a cure for any carbohydrate related disease like metabolic syndrome and diabetes and food addiction. Unfortunately, you don't immediately use your proteins and fats. You go through a period of time where you're actually really hungry and angry and all this, and that might take two or three days. We call that you're becoming fat adapted. Once you're, you've transitioned and now you're using ketones, as long as you don't introduce carbohydrates, because the brain always goes, there's carbohydrates and then goes back to that, uses the insulin and gets you back into trouble. If you can stay in the ketone system, then you will uh, not experience that craziness that can happen with the, the extremes of overeating so much or starving. Like you'll bypass that, you'll be hungry, but it won't be that kind of crazy hungry. You'll feel depleted and weak if you're not eating enough, but you won't feel that same crazy hunger that you get when you're uh, in hypoglycemic mode. Uh, and so that's why a lot of people like the keto diet. Is another way of saying it's avoiding the problem of insulin. If you're somebody who's watching and you don't want to follow a keto plan because you're a vegan or vegetarian, you can be quite healthy if you're very conscious that you don't want to eat refined carbohydrates, you just want to eat complex carbohydrates. That is fine. You'll get your you'll get the fuel that you need one way or the other. If you're eating processed food, as I said, you're eating a lot of refined carbohydrates. And here's a wonderful chart that Dr. David Unwin made that shows how much sugar there is in processed foods. And he compares it to real foods. Eggs, there is no carbohydrates, so there's no sugar. That's why it's zero. Broccoli, it's a very complex carbohydrate. It is equivalent to a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar, not very much. I mean, there is some sugar, but you gotta eat a lot of broccoli to get a lot of sugar. Top, a white boiled potato or French fries or, or pasta, there's a lot of sugar in that. The higher up you go on this list, the more energy you're getting all at once rather than spaced out over time. Many of you have heard of the term hypoglycemia. Essentially what happens when you have so much sugar all at once, you use up all that fuel, and then you have no sugar, you become what we call hypoglycemic. Your sugar drops. You are hungry, you are tired, you are fatigued, you are so uncomfortable. All you can do is think about food because you want that fuel. That's called hypoglycemia. Some people say it's hangry. I'm so angry and hungry that I'll eat anything in sight. Insulin is a transporter molecule. It carries the glucose that's in my blood to my brain. Remember, my brain needs that glucose or to my muscle cells, the rest of my cells. Blast of sugar because we find foods that are not breaking down over time, but very quickly within a half an hour, an hour. My pancreas, which makes insulin for me, has to pump out a lot of insulin and it's got to do a burst of insulin. And then within an hour and a half, you're hungry again because your fuel is down. But that means that your, your pancreas has to make another burst of insulin. And so there's this persistent bursts of insulin, which then mop up all the sugar and you're going in this, this circle of ups and downs and ups and downs, but you're also really, really creating pancreatic fatigue because it has to make all that insulin. What happens when you have all this insulin on board? Medical clinicians will say, this is a term that we call hyperinsulinemia. This is not a good thing for the body. We need to have a steady amount of insulin. You just want to have it on board two or three times a day, but not persistently throughout the day in these huge bursts. You eventually become resistant to this amount of insulin. It's almost like the body's going, there's too much. I'm not gonna to respond to all of this. It's too much. It's breaking down the receptors. The receptors start to downregulate. They're basically trying to protect themselves from this onslaught of insulin. Now, what happens when you're insulin resistant? That means that you're no longer able to take the glucose that you need it stays in the blood, it won't go into the brain. And so therefore you remain perpetually hungry and craving for food. Now this is actually not food addiction, but it sure looks like food addiction because all you can do is think about the damn food. It's all you want to think about because you're, it's your fuel and you have not yet fat adapted. That takes a few days of this experience before you get there. Other thing that happens is if the sugar is not going into my brain where I need it, it's staying in the blood. 
and now I'm getting what we then call diabetes. So the real causation of diabetes is too much insulin. Why? Because there's too much sugar on board. I become insulin resistant. I stop letting the insulin work for me. And then the consequence of that is too much sugar in the blood, which we call diabetes. If our normal sugars, and I'm speaking Canadian here, are between 3.5 and 7.3, this is Canadian units, most of the time we don't even know we're in a pre-diabetic mode. And I would suggest that if you're eating mainly processed foods, there's a very good chance you're in pre-diabetic mode. And then diabetic mode is when Finally, you become resistant and there's a level of sugar that's higher than it should be. It's now not 7.3, but it's 8, it's 9, it's 10. It could be as high as 20 or 30. This is diabetes where there's so much sugar in the blood that should be going to my brain, uh, but it's not. It's staying in the blood. And so why do we care about that? Well, number one, I'm not getting my fuel and so I'm tired and hungry all the time. But some of the consequences of too much sugar in the blood. If you have too much sugar in the blood, Think of it like little glass shards that are damaging the vessels of the body. And they're the small vessels of the body and the big vessels of the body. And overall, there's a lot of damage that's being created, like little nicks and cuts. And it's going to create an immune response because what is an immune response in our body is our body's attempt to heal. You have a strong immune response, which can then feed other types of inflammatory conditions like arthritis or Crohn's disease. The sugar is in the blood vessels. Start with the smallest blood vessels that are in the eye. And you can see the whole disease of prediabetes and diabetes just by looking at the back of a person's eye into their retina. I mean, they're using their ophthalmoscope and they can see the vessels of the eye and they can see if there's damage to the vessels. Behind me is a picture of a burst of vessel in the eye. Now that retina requires those vessels because the stimuli goes to those vessels and then from the vessels goes to the visual cortex that recognizes the stimulus from the environment into the pictures that we see. So if this connection between environment and brain is burst, we'll not be able to see anymore. And so leading cause of adult blindness is diabetes. We call them retinal hemorrhages. And is there some way that they can stop the bleed by maybe sticking a laser probe in there to sizzle up the, the vessel that's bleeding or somehow suction out the blood. Another set of small vessels are in the kidney. Leading cause of adult uh, requirement for dialysis, which is what we're looking at here, a dialysis machine or tr kidney transplant is diabetes. This dialysis machine is essentially this person's kidney because their kidney, there's been so many hemorrhages and damage to the kidney that the kidney can no longer filter out all the toxins that it requires for the person. They get hooked up to a machine two or three times a week for a few hours a day just to remove the toxins that my kidney and your kidney is doing on a daily basis. The other clinic that a diabetic will go to is the foot clinic. And I used to think before, why would they go to the foot clinic? I understand why they go to the diabetic doctor clinic or the eye clinic or the kidney clinic. Okay, it's the vessels. Why are they going to the foot clinic? Because we know that when the circulation is so uh, impaired, that means that they have poor circulation in. Now, the other thing that happens with diabetes is the nerves are also starting to get damaged. And we have what we call peripheral neuropathy. You don't feel any discomfort. Sometimes you don't even feel your foot. It feels like you're just walking on two clubs. You don't feel anymore. You don't have the same sensation. And we require sensation to determine hot, cold, pain, even posture. So we have that as a problem. So if you get a little bit of a bruise somewhere and you have poor circulation, what ends up happening is that little bruise never gets better. My immune system is already overcharged dealing with all the sugar that's in the blood and the inflammatory response that's created. It, it doesn't have a lot of focus on things like my foot or my toe. So I get a little sore somewhere and it doesn't go away. And one thing that we know about bacteria, of which we have all over our body, is that bacteria love warm, moist, dark areas. When you have something that's warm and moist and dark, bacteria flourish. So that little bruise becomes a bigger bruise and then eventually becomes a sore that does not heal. You're going to the foot clinic every three months, just like you are to the eye clinic and the kidney clinic and your doctor's clinic for the, the medications. And the doctor is saying, you know what, I'll give you more antibiotics, but I've already given you all that I've got carrying a little fanny pack of antibiotics all the time. And eventually the doctor is going to say the bacteria are winning.
get out of just the area of your foot, but actually go into your body. We call that sepsis or bacterial overgrowth, and you can die. The bacteria have overcome the whole body and the immune system, and they win. So what do we do before that happens? Easier to amputate the leg, chop the leg off. And so that's fine, you do that. If you continue to have too much sugar, it's gonna to happen to the other leg as well. And that's not an unusual scenario. You can see that diabetes, it's a chronic progressive condition. If you continue to be in the environment of a processed food industry. And you know, the thing is, is some people are just more susceptible than others to this process. I'm guessing that if you've been eating processed food your whole life, that at some level you will become at least pre-diabetic. But many of us will become diabetic, either because of the fact that they eat, they eat more sugar, or their body is just not as susceptible to fighting it off. I mean, it's variable. Diabetes is a logical response to too much sugar, and insulin resistance. Now the body has a little safeguard. It actually has an ability to store some of that sugar. That actually has a place to go in the meantime because you don't want to have that much sugar. It's not uncommon for somebody who has diabetes to go into the hospital and within two or three days, they can't see anymore. And if they don't get treatment, they could become blind right away. So the body has a little backup system where it says, okay, if you've got extra sugar, let's put it somewhere else. It's going to the fat cells. So here's where, when they say, uh, fat does not make you fat, sugar makes you fat. Sugar makes you fat of this particular variety. Now, I'm not talking about being fat phobic here. I'm actually a very big proponent of respecting our fat. The fat on our body, adipose tissue, it is an endocrine gland. It is a hormonal gland, just like my thyroid is, just like my ovaries are, just like my adrenal glands are. And we should treat it with, with the same respect that we treat those other organs. The kind of fat that I'm talking about is called subcutaneous fat. This is the kind of fat that's on my hips, on my legs, on my arms, on my face. If I'm eating a lot of foods, it gives me basically a little bit of a store. I have a little bit of extra on me for the famine. And so then I can uh, use, I have proteins and fat. So I'll use the fats first and then the proteins. So I have a little bit of fat stored to get me through. So subcutaneous fat is the fat under the skin and it's perfect. This is not about being fat phobic. It is about being very upset about the other type of fat that sugar turns into and that's called visceral fat so if you look behind me you'll see right here is an example of subcutaneous fat the fat under the skin but this fat here this is called visceral obesity and this is the fat that was in the blood and now um, from the blood is being turned into triglycerides goes into the organs that's what we call fatty liver and goes into even the pancreas and it goes into the abdominal cavity visceral obesity toxic waste it's a it's a pile of waste that's stored somewhere hopefully until we can get rid of it you can be skinny with subcutaneous fat have no scup but if you have this kind of fat this is the kind of fat that will be indicative of a potential heart attack or stroke. This kind of fat is not good fat. It's good temporarily to get the sugar out so that you don't become blind within the next month. But you don't want this for more than six months. You want this gone. Unfortunately, people live with this. And I work in a treatment center where guys lose, where guys gain 20 to 30 pounds you know they get on the scale after a month of being there and go wow doc i just gained 30 pounds i'm great thinking that it's all muscle that they've gained no it's this visceral obesity that's because of the foods that they were eating likely in the treatment center because treatment centers often give carbohydrates refined carbohydrates like a lot of cereal and pasta and, and lasagna all that stuff is just going directly into this uh, visceral obesity right here this visceral obesity along with the diabetes that has given us many of the medical concerns that we have of today. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, Alzheimer's, potential cancer, arthritis, all of these conditions. The thing that we have to do is change the food that we're eating. And I tell guys when they gain weight and they go, I don't know why I'm gaining this weight. And then I see them doing abdo crunches because they want to lose that weight. And I say, you know what? Go and sit on the couch and don't exercise at all. You don't need to exercise. What you want to do is stop eating processed foods and that fat will eventually go away. That fat that I, I am phobic of, this is, this is the stuff that um, is dangerous. And it will go if you stop eating processed foods. Why doctors don't suggest that as a first option is probably 
do to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is food addiction, because they have made the suggestion. They've said, lose the weight, but the person doesn't lose the weight or they lose the weight and they gain it back. If there is not an acknowledgement that processed food is deranging this whole process, undermining any attempt that you have to try to correct it, there's something going on. It's the processed food industry. What happens when somebody says, okay, I'm trying to do that. Um, what really was exciting to me was drugs and alcohol and boys that which like took over my life and food wasn't very important to me anymore. And in my early twenties, some stuff was going on for me. Um, and I, I stopped, I put down drugs and alcohol and my food just took off. My food took off. And um, when I say that, what I mean, I don't even, I, I wouldn't have said at the time my food took off, but my weight took off is what took, you know, um, I uh, gained, I, I actually don't know at that time, but probably a hundred pounds in, in a couple of years. And I was, um, I tried a lot. I tried many different diets and exercise programs. So it was not for lack of trying. I worked really hard at this. I went to doctors, I went to um, emotional eating disorder um, treatment centers, I went to eat emotional eating disorder groups, I had weight loss surgery, like I was relentless trying to figure this out. Um, and, you know, it all just left me thinking, oh, there's something really wrong with me. I I'm weak, you know. Um, and I got into the addiction treatment world, um, about 15 years ago and was in it off and on since then. And, um, I also was in my own recovery from drugs and alcohol. And I, and I knew that I felt like the same way with food, but no one ever talked about it. And so to me, it was just, no, it's just you, man, you're just weak, get it together. You can't even get it together with food. So, um, I got pretty desperate after I had my weight loss surgery and, and it was, of course it didn't work because, um, I couldn't follow the diet that they'd given me. Um, I got really, really sick. And, um, once again, it was just another complete failure for me. And, but I, now we go back to our three categories that Phil Wardell recommended that we use. So I've just talked about normal eaters, the hormonal endocrine model, how insulin works, how ghrelin works, how leptin works and how insulin can derange the whole thanks to the abundance of refined carbohydrates in processed foods. Then the doctor might say, well, you know what? Maybe you have an eating disorder. So I'll send you down the hallway to see the psychologist and you'll talk to a psychologist about maybe the fact that you have binge eating disorder or you have bulimia or you have some form of anorexia with uh, binge eating. And so let's deal with that. And the theory behind the eating disorder model is it's not actually about the processed food. In fact, let's not focus on the foods at all probably you, the person who can't stop eating, even when you're eating proper foods, it's because you're using food for a psychological reason. You're using it because you're upset, you have previous trauma, you don't know how to cope. So you're using food as a crutch, as a way to, I guess we call it emotional eating. If you look at the emotions and the, the cause of the emotional distress, look at the psychology behind your issue, fix that then you don't need to think about the food at all. In fact, thinking about the food distracts from the emotional piece and the psychological piece. So don't even worry about the food, worry about your issues. And then eventually the food will just settle naturally, normally through intuitive eating and mindful eating and all this sort of stuff. Works really well in this model. But I would like to suggest, and the people in the food addiction world say, there's another dimension that's happening that we continually ignore, and that's the food addiction dimension. You can have a problem with the hormonal piece. You may have a problem with uh, binge eating. It's not to say you can't be all three of these. You can have a problem with food addiction as well, or you can be just one of the three. And this makes it very hard to diagnose because it's so hard to know. What do we have in common with all of these foods? All of these foods, processed foods, have sugar in common, probably salt, because what makes foods preserved but sugar and salt? And a lot of them have fat in them as well. And that combo is what we call the golden triangle of food. In all cases, whether it be protein, or oils or carbohydrates, it's all of the refined variety. I've talked about ghrelin, insulin, and leptin. Also, the neurochemical aspect is deranged as well. So let's talk about that. The neurochemical model is looking at the brain neurochemistry. This is the model that we use in addiction. We're actually using now the same neurochemicals that 
drugs and alcohol use, our reward pathway uses. This is the realm of addiction medicine. We have three reward neurochemicals. Dopamine is the neurochemical of excitement, of anticipation, of reward, of looking forward to. I can't wait till I get home to have this thing. So that's dopamine. Sugar and anything that translates very quickly into sugar, like those bursts of sugar when you're eating refined foods, enhance dopamine. We've actually seen that on PET scans, where the dopamine uptake when you eat sugar is high as if you're doing cocaine. Like it's high, it's higher than normal. Dopamine is our natural neurochemical of excitement and desire. And when we take a drug that enhances that, including food, we feel extra excited and extra good. That's dopamine. We look in general here, this is a slide that kind of gives you levels of, of drugs and normal. Normal dopamine that we have, like I said, it's a normal natural neurochemical of desire and excitement. Normal to get through a day that we're given, it's a motivator. We're given 100 to 200 to get through a day. 100 just to get through the day and 150, 200 to make the effort to make food, to you know have go to the trouble of having sex, getting a job and work and accomplishments. We I mean, you gotta get a little bit of extra pleasure, excitement for your efforts. And that's the zero to 200, that's normal range. If that's normal, these last three are called abnormal or, or ordinary versus extraordinary or natural versus supernatural. We live in the natural realm, although we can move into the supernatural, more than 200 realm for supernatural experiences, which don't happen that often. We can also take those spaces that are supposed to be our supernatural enclaves for once in a while to get us through hard times. Well, you can rent that space by just taking drugs and alcohol and food and live there all the time. And then what happens, like with anything, you end up becoming tolerant. It's just like when we talked about the uh, insulin and insulin resistance. Now you're becoming dopamine resistant because the body is going, you're not supposed to be in this supernatural realm all this time. You actually start to downregulate the dopamine receptors. You now need more uh, dopamine or cocaine or a crystal meth or, or sugar, whichever way you're getting that dopamine, you're going to need more of it to get the effect of the extra high that you want, which is 200 or more. But now you need 400 to feel 200 and eventually you'll need 600 to feel 200 because the body will continually try to um, not let you stay there for too long. That's called tolerance. That desire for 400, which is obsession, that's the first definition of addiction. Then the next criteria is tolerance. And then the next criteria is dependence. Now, if I need 400 to feel 200, that means I need 200 to feel 100. And if I don't have 200 because I stop, for some reason I decide I better stop, uh, I will then go into minus. I'll go not to, back to zero. I'll go to minus 200, minus 300, maybe, who knows? It's never been studied. You see, clinically, a person is devastated. We call this post-acute withdrawal. They are in such pain because they're in minus dopamine, which means they're not interested in anything. They hurt everywhere. Endorphins is pain relief. Now they hurt. Serotonin is connection. They feel so alone and so depressed and they don't want to do anything. This is a very miserable state to be. You become dependent on your substance just to feel normal. Now you're in what we call post-acute withdrawal. And if you truly do stop your substance, you will upregulate your receptors. Maybe takes three or four weeks back to almost normal. If you can withstand that horrible experience of the two to four weeks. That period of withdrawal is what gets people to back to using over and over and over again, because it's, it's in the same way as the feeling supernaturally great, you're feeling supernaturally devastated. And that's very hard to withstand for a prolonged period of time. Huge obsession, you have tolerance that develops, dependence that develops. And of course, when you're taking so much, there's all sorts of impairment that's happening, but you're still going to use because you don't want to go into withdrawal. I mean, that's the definition of addiction, tolerance, dependence, impairment, and obsession. And if you fulfill all those criteria, you have addiction, sugar addiction, food addiction, cocaine addiction. This is a chronic progressive condition that continues. Then you have addiction. It can start with the hypersensitivity of sugar initially, the addictive eating, but then it becomes its own momentum, its own little monster, its own little voice in the head. It takes its own little personality. This thing has morphed almost into another 
person, like a third party that's now sitting in your brain. Bitten Johnson in Sweden calls it the red dog. And it's this disease, if you want to call it disease. If you don't like that, you can call it a disorder. If you're coming from a psychological realm, you can call it a lot of bad learning that's happened, actually morphed into its own pattern of thinking. And you can disentangle all that with therapy, et cetera. It's a lot of work. You can't just say, no, it's going to stop. Usually once a person has this thing that's morphed, it's more a question of how do I manage this condition that has now happened in the same way as if I'm a diabetic, I can become a functional diabetic, taking meds and eating well, my sugars are now under control. But the moment I eat something bad, my sugars are off the rails again. Similarly here, I can become a functional food addict in remission. As long as I'm eating well, I'm not thinking about food, it's not impairing, it's not causing any distress in my life. But the moment I start eating that stuff again, this comes back in full force, and then I'm back into the food again and back into using basically a relapse. Serotonin is the neurochemical of satisfaction, of chill, of connection, of safety and endorphin is the neurochemical of pain relief if you're eating something that has high dopamine or, or taking a drug you are excited and thrilled if there's a fair amount of serotonin in it you feel socially connected and if there's endorphin you feel numb from pain alcohol is a perfect example of a drug or substance that gives all three you get the excitement and tipsy feeling that's dopamine you get the social glue and the social connectedness you know you're able to talk to people and not feel stupid anymore you can dance on tables no problem this is serotonin and then when you're having a bad day you have a drink so that you kind of numb out the pain of the day there's the endorphin working and guess what sugar does the same thing it, it gives the dopamine the serotonin and then the endorphin this is why people will eat a tub of ice cream when they're upset. It's the same as having a bottle of wine when they're upset. How you can become a food addict. Almost to my death, uh, this disease. And I started uh, ha experiencing uh, symptoms uh, at a very early age. However, I didn't start gaining weight until uh, a, a bit later in my teens. But the relationship with food and the eating and not being able to stop eating certain foods started at a very, very early age for me. Started very early to try to find ways. I was very uh, health conscious and uh, ate only very organic foods for the most part. I became a vegetarian and a vegan like 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> so I've been there, done that. And But the interesting thing was that no matter how healthy I was, I would never lose uh, the problem with food and the uh, the overeating that I got caught up in. Then, of course, it came the cycles of restriction and restricting versus the binging and the eating and the weight gain, a constant weight gain. Now, this was became my life uh, mm -hmm. from uh, from 16 to 48 and uh, escalating every year to the point of me wanting to die. I, I felt uh, when I was 48, I fall, felt uh, more than 60 and I thought that was really old. And now I am older than 60 and I feel 48. I just wanna show the connection between these two systems. I've talked about ghrelin, leptin and insulin as appetite enhancers and suppressors. Ghrelin, which is, remember, the hormone that makes me hungry it has a connection to dopamine. And have you ever noticed when you're starting to get hungry, you're not just noticing the pain of the hunger or the discomfort, you're actually also starting to think about food. Oh, I'm a bit hungry. I wonder what I'm going to eat. There's a back door of Graylin to, to dopamine. And when you're starving, because you're hypoglycemic, that's the insulin um, hypoglycemic response. You're not just thinking about food a little bit. It is the only thing that you can think about. You might be in class and all you can think about is when is this class over? Because I have to go have my latte with a muffin as well. Insulin has a backdoor to dopamine, high insulin, high dopamine. And leptin is a suppressant of dopamine. That's why when you're eating something and you feel full, you don't really want to eat anymore. And if somebody said, hey, here's some food, 
you love this stuff. I just brought some for you. You don't really want any more, even though you know you like it. Yeah, I'm too full. Because leptin has dampened the dopamine and you're not looking forward to it. That's natural. But if you come in with a history of deranged neurochemical imbalance because you have an addiction previous, for example, this is very common, a person with alcoholism stops drinking, they don't have a way to have their dopamine, serotonin, and endorphin enhancement anymore. They will happily go to sugar because what is alcohol but fermented sugar? They're basically cousins of each other. So it's very easy to transfer the addiction from alcohol to food. But even something like cocaine or opiates or marijuana, you, you're getting these neurochemicals, you stop them, and food is there to step in thanks to this back door. If you have a predisposition because of a previous addiction, it's it's like a hungry mouth that's just waiting to be fed by something If you think else. about the brain as three parts, the middle part is the instinctual reward motivational part, and the top part of the brain is where our willpower sits. It's our higher order thinking. That part of our brain is the weakest of our whole brain. The bottom part, which is the fundamental life-sustaining non-thinking part is the most important but then that middle part of the brain, which is our motivational instinctual part, is more important than our thinking and our higher order thinking. That's just to make life extra nice. But I need the motivational part to stay alive. I can not think and be alive, but I can't not have a functioning middle part of the brain. And in that middle part of the brain, we have the nucleus accumbens, which is our pleasure button. That's where the dopamine and the serotonin and the endorphins go. And the amygdala, which is our panic button. When you're in withdrawal, you go, oh no, oh no, I'm, I, I'm gonna go into withdrawal. And that's where the stress response hits. When you've got both instinctual drives, roped in, which is what happens with food addiction, you are in trouble. It's the red dog. And willpower is a flimsy little thing that has maybe 10 or 20 minutes of force. It's supposed to moderate the whole thing as long as everything is running fairly smoothly. But when that middle part of the brain is so deranged, which is what happens with addiction, the willpower doesn't really have much chance at all, which is why you do things that you don't want to do. Addiction is just too powerful. So let's just bring this to specifics about food. If you want to get a really good hit of dopamine, go for the sugars and the white starches. That's like the crack of food, is sugar and white starches. It's glycemic index, it's on the refined corner. If you want to get lots of serotonin, then you do the breads and the pastas and the bananas and the warm milk. Why do you have warm milk when you're trying to go to sleep at night? Because you want to feel safe and rested. You want to feel excited. You want to feel just relaxed and easy. You have a nice warm milk. Um, or pasta and you fall asleep in an hour. So that's serotonin. Endorphins are pain relievers. People love chocolate. I'm a chocoholic. It's the opiate of the foods. Sh add sugar and dairy to that, and which is usually what happens with chocolate. It's not just dark chocolate. It's the sugar and the dairy, but the perfect uh, type of opiate uh, of food. The spices will give you endorphins as well. And, and there's been some talk about uh, wheat also giving endorphins. Uh, it has a morphine-like quality in it. So foods will give you some of these qualities and if you eat foods that really heap this on now you can see why they're addictive and here's a chart that was made of the most addictive processed foods you can see why chocolate you see here in chocolate number one is leading the pack ice cream french fries pizza cookie chips cake popcorn cheeseburger muffin Oh, in the top 10 of processed foods, the most addictive. I remember thinking at one time that muffins were not that addictive because they weren't candy, they weren't cake. Well, in fact, they are cake, but I didn't know that because it wasn't called cake. Anyway, it's on the 10 top. The bottom here, if you look, 34 is broccoli, cucumber, water, rice, not that addictive. They're not processed foods, they're very low on the glycemic index. If you want to uh, treat your food addiction, you want to eat foods that are very unprocessed. The last part of this talk is to talk about treatment. First of all, I really truly believe that there is no one size that fits all. Some people do well with a very structured program where their food plan is weighed and measured and they have to give them, um, you know, um, accountability on a daily basis or what have you. Some people, work very well with a much more looser and permissive structure where they can sort of build their own thing and do you know what works for them and what doesn't work for them and but the one thing that i found that absolutely 100 percent doesn't work is the expectation 
to be 100% perfect all of the time. That does not work for anyone. And before we talk about treatment, we have to say a little bit about the clinical stages of food addiction. So I've described how addiction develops and that it becomes its own entity. It's not just that you're eating addictive foods. That's when you're still in the Zoom room of addiction, as it were. If you stop eating those addictive foods, you can get out and leave. You can actually probably still go in once in a while and then leave because nothing has really changed yet. Like that tolerance and that dependence has not yet developed. You're still in early stages. Early stage is where most of us who aren't actually full on food addicts are. They eat a little bit, they like the feeling, it's exciting. They say, okay, that's all I'm gonna have. They, then they leave and they go away and it's fine. And then they can come back and have a little bit. If you're at that stage, just stay there, but be very careful. Don't eat uh, extra foods excessively because you don't want it to get worse. It's a bit like somebody who is drinking. If you just drink once in a while, you control your drinking, you're okay to have a night out every once in a while. But if you continue to do that on a regular basis because you've lost your job or your husband has left you, your wife has left you, you're so upset that you have to drink every day, you're gonna slowly, gradually develop that phenomenon of addiction that happens and move into a middle stage where there is no going back. You can't just get out anymore. So middle stage, food addiction is where changes have already started to happen. Think that there's something about your eating that you don't like. Maybe you've got weight that you're not happy about and you want to start modifying, but you don't want to completely stop everything. You don't want to be that restrictive. You might be able to get away with a program that helps you restrict the processed foods and join something like Weight Watchers, or you might join keto community and just avoid the whole carbohydrate mess and just eat keto foods. And people can do that, essentially treating their food addiction without even realizing that they're doing it. Or you can be pure plant-based, but not eat refined food. Make sure that you focus just on refined foods. Or you can just do cal caloric restriction, because if you follow that very closely, you're not going to eat a lot of high sugar, high fat, high salt combos, which are highly uh, caloric as well. But it isn't actually the calories it's the problem that watching those calories will knock out the problems which is the sugar it might be in that middle stage that you might think about doing bariatric surgery okay i'm starting to gain weight um i want to stop eating as much is there some way i can surgically deal with this problem there are different types of bariatric surgery there's four of them the adjustable gastric band the ruan y the vertical sleeve and the duodenal bypass in order of complexity. And these will reduce the stomach size so that you don't eat as much. And they'll also reduce what's actually more important, the absorption of the foods that you're eating. The problem with bariatric surgery is, yes, you will lose the weight, but if you don't change the diet, you'll probably gain the weight back or quite a lot of it back. Part of the reason why that is that the foods that you are able to take will have to be very processed and refined because you can't eat a lot of broccoli when you have this much stomach. I mean, the stomach was this big and now it's only this big. You can't eat a lot of broccoli. You're going to have to eat a lot of mushed up food, which is the very stuff that's addictive. And alcohol, which is basically fermented sugar, is the most potent of all. You don't have to eat anything. It's just liquid. The, the risk of becoming alcoholic is much higher post bariatric surgery. And finally, if you're in early to middle stage, you might be able to get away with cognitive behavioral therapy or mindful eating, this sort of eating disorder practices. And that might be enough. If you were doing a lot of comfort eating, it might be able to keep you away so that you don't continually progress into the final stage or third or fourth stage. And medications, we have medications now like the GLP-1s. I'm gonna do a whole uh, talk on that itself, which actually do reduce appetite to some degree and certainly help you lose weight. I mean, it's, not, it's not a panacea. You don't lose all your weight. You might lose 20 or 30 percent of your weight, which is pretty good. But if I can just give you perspective, if you stop eating processed foods and stop eating addictively, you can lose 50 percent or 60 percent of your weight and keep it off forever without any medication. Anyway, those things may work here as long as you don't get fooled into thinking that you can continue to eat. If it helps you stay away from the, the processed foods, which will continually keep you into the practice of eating, uh, then it's not going to help at all. And we have the third and the fourth stage of food addiction. And this is where 
the actual change has happened. The obsession is, of course, there. The tolerance has developed. The dependence has developed. It's not just that you want the food and enjoy the food. As a matter of fact, by third or fourth stage, you're no longer eating for pleasure anymore. You don't actually get the pleasure that you had when you were in stage one. You're now at a stage where eating so that you don't feel terrible. I have to eat so that I can sleep tonight. I have to eat so that I can function in the same way as the opiate user has to use or else they're going to be on the toilet all night or the alcoholic will have a seizure. They have to do their substance or else. And that happens very much the same with food. Anybody who says that food addiction does not have a withdrawal does not know what food addiction withdrawal is. It's craving, obsession of thinking about food, inability to sleep, agitation, hunger, generally anxiety. If you're at that stage where you're eating because you have to, it's not even for pleasure, you've moved into stage three. Because remember, that's kicked into the instinctual drive of the brain, um, which is for pleasure and also to avoid pain. The nucleus accumbens and the amygdala, both of those have been hooked on. That's stage three and four. So now how do you get out of stage three and four? It's no longer just hormonal. This is no longer just psychological eating disorder. This is an addiction to the substance. I now need this or else. I have to abstain from that substance. If I abstain from that substance, yes, I will go into withdrawal. No question about it. But if I don't pick up the substance here and there, like on a cheat Saturday or a cheat birthday, or where I'm just gonna continually put myself out of withdrawal, back into withdrawal, and I'm continually going back and forth. If I can get through the actual post-acute withdrawal, which is two to three weeks, with food, it's usually about 10 days. Alcohol, it's a bit longer. Cocaine, it's less. It's probably similar to cigarettes. Sugar addiction and cigarette addiction are very similar in how pervasive and hard they are to stop. And once you're done, you're done. If you are an ex-smoker and you don't want a cigarette anymore, the good news is that's exactly how you'll feel with sugar. It'll be like, so glad I don't do that anymore. You have to abstain. You have to get through the post-acute withdrawal. The more progressive you become, the more narrow your, your food choices are. Because there's a lot of people who will say, you know what, I am addicted to not just sugar and carbohydrates, I'm addicted to dairy, I'm addicted to sweeteners, I'm addicted to grains, I can't nuts, I can't eat these things anymore. When the window of opportunity of food gets smaller and smaller, it's because they're usually in later stage of addiction. And you don't want to continue because it's going to get narrower and narrower until you're eating the most bland of foods. And anyway, if you get off that bus and then eat normal food, you will reclimatize with the foods that you can still eat, you can learn to love. A lot of people can get by on just eating the same five or 10 things throughout the week and love that food like it's actually okay this is not a program of deprivation because you can still love those foods that you're eating but it's true you're going to have less and less the more progressed you are eventually some people can even become addicted to volume just the feeling of volume this is usually later stage people who are addicted to volume not only have, can they not eat sugar and flour and probably not dairy probably not sweeteners probably not nuts all individualized depending on where you are on the continuum of or the stages of food addiction it may even be that it's changed over time what you used to be able to eat you can't eat anymore it's forever changing person may actually have to stop eating volume by weighing and measuring their food it, which is not restricting their food it's not i'm eating less and less and less it's i'm still going to eat a healthy amount but i'm going to make sure i eat that much because my ability to gauge whether that's enough or a little is lost what i've explained here is that there's different stages of addiction even within a person over time and there are different responses to that treatment this is why we recommend that you have a food coach that could be in a 12-step program or that could be a coach that you hire uh, it could be in a group that you are. You want to have somebody, not just you, because the addict mind is not a mind to be trusted. Somebody that you trust, that you can speak to, uh, and that gives you that containment. Food is something that you have to do two or three times a day, and you don't want to leave it up to chance, especially late stage food addiction, where you could be, if unchecked, eating food 24 seven. I've heard many people say they're on the floor in pain up all night. The moment that that pain is relieved a little bit, they're eating more food. If you take the addiction model beyond the hormonal model, which may, might be just following a keto plan, you will get 
a lot of the tools that are necessary when things have morphed into an addiction. Social support, because you can't do this alone. Some version of accountability, because we can't trust ourselves. And then lots of rel relapse prevention tools. These are all things to recognize I am now like the person who has had an episode of depression or diabetes. I am now somebody who has lived that experience and in a sense, I'm in remission. I am more likely to have that episode than somebody who's never had that episode. So now I have to be extra cautious. And that extra caution doesn't have to be anxious. It's just, you know, when I'm going out, I'm going to call and find out ahead what that restaurant has, what my guest is ordering, if I should bring my own food, plan ahead and have my lunches with me. It's just being a little bit extra cautious in the same way as a person who's on medication will make sure they have enough meds when they're going away. We don't just want to get people abstinent. We also want to give them tools to stay in recovery and then to stay living life in a different way than they've never experienced before. So that is a lot about their emotional resilience. Where are they at emotionally? Where are they at mentally? A lot of us want to, we want to get better, but we don't want to change our thinking and our, our reactions to our feelings. And it just doesn't work that way. So we help people have tools to, to keep living in sobriety. How are we going to set people up to, to live in the world? And let's face it that a lot of people dealing with food addiction, for many people, it's their last addiction. So they've peeled off these layers and now it's just them and it's raw. And so we don't encourage people to go into deep trauma work in the early stages. And we find that many people do. Anyways, it just goes there. That's where they go. What we're trying to always do is get people connected to their bodies. How are they feeling? What's going on in their body? And if a big feeling comes up, we process it with them. We talk to them about it. And it, it can really depend. It might be doing anger work. It might be doing fear work. It, it really depends on where they're at. So I did not create this wheel. I'm just, we're just copying it from other people. But what we see for people that have long-term recovery and freedom is they are rigorously abstinent. First thing, they are rigorously abstinent. They stay very connected to some sort of peer group. We highly recommend the 12 steps. That's not a have to, but we highly recommend it. That's what I know. So that's what I can talk about. These people also are really committed to being in professional support. They stay close to our professional organization or to another professional organization. And they literally work their program like their life depends on it. And that doesn't mean their whole life is taken over by it. The truth is they just have this freedom that they never thought they'd have. I don't think it's one person's got something special. I wish I had the answer why, why person A is willing to and why person B isn't. I don't know that answer, but what I know for sure is that no one's ever hopeless. People are not hopeless by any stretch. If people just show up and do those things, stay abstinent, stay close to their peers, work a program like a 12-step program and get a lot of professional support, especially in the first one to two years, they're going to stay abstinent and they're going to get a life of freedom. Food is such a small part of this. It's such a small part of it. And that's what we're going for, that our mind isn't obsessed with food. What am I going to eat? Is there going to eat enough? Are people watching me? How big is my body? We don't have to have those thoughts anymore. We get to live life. That ends my talk. I've talked about the three models of disordered eating, the hormonal piece, which is just the body's response to an abnormal environment of the processed food industry. I've talked about the psychological response, not very much about eating disorders. And I've talked about food addiction, which is the phenomena that can happen on its own, especially if you have a previous history of addiction, either family history or your own history, or it can develop out of the hormonal model, where if you're under constant exposure of a drug inducing substance, you will eventually catch the addiction. If you're constantly eating sugar, not getting out of that environment enough, and food addiction has its own stages, basically progressively getting worse, and there are different ways to manage those. Over time, you have to figure out where you fit, and what will work best for you. And I ask you, please get off the bus before you get to the end stage. But even if you're at the end stage, there is hope. There's a lot of support out there for food addiction in the form of 12-step programs, in the form of support groups. I have a free Facebook group. I'm Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life. 
in the form of books like my book and more and books are being written. There's a lot of coaches and support persons out there now to help people with food addiction. I would encourage you to get those because if you're at end stage, you're not going to figure this out by yourself. If you could, you would have already done so. Nobody wants to be a food addict in the same way that nobody wants to be three or 400 pounds. They didn't know how to stop. They didn't know how to get out of it. The point is, is there is a way out and there is actually help now. If you do get help and follow the addiction model, follow all the suggestions, you will get out of that post-acute withdrawal phase and you will learn how to not get relapse back in, then you'll be in a situation where even though your food may be limited, you can't eat all the same stuff that all your friends are eating. You will learn to love the food that you like, seriously love it. And you will be a weight that is the best for your body. And you'll stay at that weight. You won't be fluctuating back and forth. There really is a positive end to this site. It's actually freedom from addiction. The phrase I love to use is freedom tastes great. And the way to get to that place of freedom tastes great is to get support. Once you have support, you'll realize the power is ours. Thank you.